Good morning. I am uh, uh, Pastor Vern. I'm a pastor at Baptist Church on Homedale in Klamath. Uh, pastoring for a little, a little bit, almost a year there. So, um, and Mr. King called and said that he was going to go vacation in Hawaii and leave you all to deal with COVID on your own. So. He needed someone to fill in, so I said I was happy to do that this morning. Um, this I, if we're getting ready to move into the holiday season. As we begin to move into that holiday season, it, you know, we take time to to think of what does it represent and what is its purpose and these different things and, and we look at it and so we, we move in and there's you know the umpteen million Hallmark movies and all you know everything that's out there and we look at that but as we begin to move in that direction you know I was really thinking about recently um, what is it that the gospel message is, is speaking about what is it saying what what is the overall emphasis on that and when we begin to look at the gospel message you know the the fact that if we look at the Christmas story and so the birth of Christ and the life of Christ and even if we move into you know Easter and we just go through this progression of the calendar and we begin to look at it and, and we see you know the death and the resurrection what does it all mean and it really comes down to something that I, I, I feel like the church forgets to talk about a lot and that is the topic of forgiveness and and we oftentimes want to focus on you know we want to focus on the salvation part and we want to focus on uh, the righteous living and we go through the epistles of the New Testament and and a lot of churches today have forgotten that there's an Old Testament and, and we just begin to just go on an, in this robotic manner of how we live our lives and what is righteous living for us and we forget the emphasis of forgiveness we begin to, to forget that the actual act of, of death and, and what Christ was doing was paying the price for our sins and he was saying that our sins had been forgiven and so this morning as we begin you know to to do that is to think about um, what it is to to be forgiven what is forgiveness when we break down what the concept of forgiveness is and so as we begin to move towards Christmas right as we move through Thanksgiving and we focus on on thankfulness and, 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 and we bring the year to a close and the things that we've gone through and we say you know Lord thanks for bringing us to to where we've had right and it's been another difficult year right it's one that just you know just at a national level we look at and go boy I just don't understand it and then we begin to look here locally just even within uh, the basin and our surrounding communities here within Klamath County and, and we think boy it's been a difficult year right and then we just throw COVID on top of all of that right and and no one no one goes untouched right so you guys are the last standing bunch you should have just closed your doors and not let anybody in so and I was the last I was well I'm not going to take credit because you guys brought one other pastor and so it wasn't me <laughs> But when we think about forgiveness, when we look at that, you know, this morning, it really it, it's, is a topic that unfortunately is not discussed uh, at length within the church anymore. And, and it's, un, it, it's unfortunate because it's really the foundation of our faith, right? And so when we begin to look at that, then we begin to realize that there really is no greater example of forgiveness than Jesus of Nazareth. And so as we go through this discussion this morning, I would like to point out four points on how Jesus for, taught forgiveness, right, throughout his ministry. And those four points and so really the first point is that we we forgive to be forgiven secondly Jesus teaches that we forgive every offense third we forgive even if the offender is not willing to repent and four God is always faithful to forgive and those are some tough points but I've come to find that Jesus is kind of a hard teacher right he doesn't tiptoe around things and he oftentimes throws stuff in front of us that is really hard to comprehend because it goes against logic right that first one is that we forgive to be forgiven right and and so he begins teaching that and so for christians the forgiveness is carried out in two parts first part is through our words the act of saying i forgive you right but then the second part is oftentimes harder and that is our actions and so when we look at the word forgive it, it is a grace word in our in the english language as well as in greek so it's translated and its meaning is to give or to grant and that meaning is to remit a debt to give up resentment or claim for requital or to pardon an offense so I'll say that again when we look at the word forgive both English and Greek when we bring it back around to what does that mean 
And it's broken down in two different meanings, right? First is that it's the meaning to give or to grant, to, to give something or to grant something to another person. And it's to remit a debt, to give up resentment or a claim for requital or to pardon an offense. You see, the Christian forgiveness itself, it encompasses our action more than just our words, right? So more than just saying, I forgive you, or more than just saying, I forgive your debt, or I remit, or I'm not asking anything more of you, I grant this grace to you, it's followed by these acts of action, right? Our confession with God involves us seeing our sin, first and foremost, recognizing our sin within us as He sees it. Right? It's one thing to look at a sin and to say, well, I know that that's wrong. And then what? We give it, we give an excuse, right? We justify it. I know I shouldn't be holding resentment towards that person, but they did do this one thing to me, right? And so we hold that, we justify it. We need to begin to see sin the way God sees it, right? So our Bible tells us that the wages of sin are death, right? It immediately, it doesn't say this particular sin, it doesn't give a list, it doesn't, there's not a graph where we bring it down and, oh, lying's here. So that's one point, you know, and if we hit five points, then that equals death. No, it says the wages of sin, death is equal to all sin across the board, right? God cannot look upon sin. He cannot see sin. He cannot be near sin, which was the purpose of sending his son, Jesus, right? His son comes, he's crucified for us. His blood is shed and that blood covers our sin so that when God looks upon us, he says, what sin? Okay, and so when we begin to look at that and we realize that our confession with God involves us seeing his sin, our sin as he sees it, and then God bringing forth his forgiveness. All right, and so as we sin against others, we are actually sinning against God. When we commit a wrong towards another person, what we're doing is we're actually committing a wrong not just towards that person, but towards God. Why is that? Because all men are created in who? God's image, right? So we're created in God's image. So when we do something to someone else, we're sinning against others, we're sinning against God. And so we have to ask God to forgive us our sins, but we also have to be willing to forgive our fellow man. And so when we look at this, it brings us to that first point that Jesus teaches is that you have to forgive to be forgiven. And so when we come to Jesus' first example of forgiveness, we begin to return to this definition of forgiveness that is of remitting a debt, right? It's, it's erasing. To remit something is to erase it, to remove it completely. It's non-existent, right? So we're remitting the debt. We're pardoning an offense. It's no longer there, right? You've been convicted. You've been found to pardon something is that you've already been found guilty for it. Okay? You can't be pardoned unless you've already been found guilty for it. So you're paying the consequence. You've been found. You've been tried and found guilty. But to pardon that is to say that it doesn't matter anymore. It's gone. It's over. It's forgiven. And so we find that the importance of forgiveness throughout Christian, uh, Christ's ministry as he's continuously reminding the apostles and the church leaders of the day that he had not come to minister those who were well, but again to those that were sick. And so we see that Christ came to mend broken hearts, to give hope to the hopeless, to forgive the unforgivable. His was not a message of condemnation but instead it's always been a message of redemption. And so when we begin to see this, we go and we know that we're in the Sermon on the Mount. And if you turn in your Bibles and you're in Matthew chapter 6 and we're seeing these things and, and Jesus is teaching throughout Matthew chapter 6 and he's talking about what is necessary. And in chapter 6, he's talking about giving to the needy. And so we go through that. But then it comes to this topic of prayer. And so Jesus is sitting there and he's teaching and the apostles come to him and they say, well, you know, teach us to pray. You know, and so Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't pray for, for a show. Don't pray for, for an action. But instead, and he gives them this example, right? He gives them the template. And he says, starting in verse 9, he says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but but deliver us for the evil one. And so in verse 14, it says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. 
right? And we oftentimes we stop there at verse 13. We, we do the Our Father. We say, Jesus, this is how Jesus taught us. And then you, you can go on and we could, we, could do, we could do an entire sermon series on the Lord's Prayer, right? Each piece broken down, how God is calling us to approach the kingdom, to recognize God, to be in a state of prayer, to be in a state of recognition, then to present our petitions to Him, right? And then there's this point of forgiveness, and we want to skip over that real quick and go back to giving God all the honor and glory, right? But the reality is, is that the only follow-up to that entire template that Jesus states is in regards to forgiving each other the debts. Right? Jesus follows up with something very, very important that oftentimes as a church we forget to take to heart. And that is that if we don't forgive other people, God will not forgive us. Okay, it's a twofold process. And so we begin to look at that. And so we see that here we're taught by Christ and he's saying that if we, we're sinning against others and we're sinning against God and we're causing harm to one of his creation. And so we must be willing to forgive. All right. And, and so not only to God and asking God for it, but those people that we've offended as well. So we're not only going and saying, God, I'm really sorry. It's one thing to say, you know, in your room and to recognize, oh, man, I, I really messed up on that one. I, I, I think I insulted to that person or you know my actions that just wasn't right I shouldn't have done it that way whatever the case may be but when it's brought to us sure we need to ask forgiveness from God absolutely but it's a two part process right it's the words and the actions and we have a responsibility to go to that person that we know that we've been offended and to ask their forgiveness, right? If it comes to you like that, if it's coming to the, that's the Holy Spirit moving on you. That's the Holy Spirit bringing, not condemnation, but conviction, right? Because to walk with unforgiveness is to be unforgiven, right? When Jesus is talking about forgiveness, there's a lot of things that go into it, right? Jesus was like the original Dr. Phil, Okay. When we start looking at Jesus, recognize because he created us, right? He knows how we were designed. He understands how we work. And to walk around with unforgiveness in your heart is to be walking around with poison inside of you. The process of forgiveness is a process of release. The process of forgiveness is the process of freedom. And this is why Jesus is talking over and over about forgiveness. You see, the forgiveness that Christ offers us is what? It's our freedom from death. See, what Jesus is offering when he said it is finished, when the debt was paid in full by his sacrifice on the cross for us, what he was saying is, it's finished. I forgive you. Your debt is paid in full. You are free. In turn, he is asking us to free others who have done wrongs to us or to give others that we have wronged the opportunity to free themselves. Because... What are the things that we have to forgive? What are the things that just stick and eat at you all the time? When we talk about forgiveness, we're not talking about anything small. It's one thing for someone to bump into you and say, oh, excuse me, I, I apologize, and we say, oh, no problem, that's okay. Were you even truly offended to begin with? Probably not, but social standards have taught us that if you bump into someone, say you're sorry, in turn they say it's okay, and we go on our way, right? If someone backs into your vehicle in the parking lot, you get a little upset, right? That's not there, but if they're good and they come and they talk to you and they get out and they try to make amends, right? And then we go through the insurance process, and, and it's okay, and, and we're okay with that. We're not truly offended. When we're talking about forgiveness, what are we talking about? Christ is talking about the things that poison our souls, the things that wound our hearts. These are the things, these are the debts that need to be forgiven. The true sins, the true wounds against us. The words of a father that just never go away. The abandonment of a mother. The betrayal of a brother. The continuous harsh words of a spouse. 
See, these are the things that Christ is talking about, and these are the things that sit in our minds and dig into our souls here on earth. They hold us in captivity because it's not something that you can simply say, oh, that's okay. It isn't something that just simply goes away. It isn't something that you can remove with a word. It's a two-part process. The words, or the mind and the heart, and then the action, which is the follow-through. And so when we begin to look at that, and we say that it says here in Matthew 18, 18, Jesus writes, I tell you the truth, that whatever that you bind here on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. Again, Jesus is following up. Right, 12 chapters later, Jesus goes right back to what he said right after he taught the apostles how to pray. A little bit different terminology, but what he is saying is that if you don't forgive people on earth, it can, won't be forgiven in heaven. See, what he's saying is that if you carry it here on earth, you're going to carry it with you to judgment day. Is unforgiveness going to keep you out of heaven? No. No. But Christ says that how we live our lives will determine the rewards that we receive in heaven. How we live our lives will determine the number of people who come and say, unbeknownst to us, but on that great day, when heaven is made new, when the earth is made new, when we are rejoicing before God in his kingdom for eternity, how many people will come and say, I am here today because of something that you did. But if there are people who are going to come and say, I'm here today because of something you did, how many people will be in hell because of something that you said or did as well? You see, it's twofold. You can't have the devil without God. Right? And you can't have salvation without damnation. How we act, our purpose. Last time I was here, we talked about the divine purpose. Your purpose... <laughs> solely in God's mind the talents that he gives you is what to do kingdom work on his behalf and what his one goal is is to ensure as many people as possible hear his message receive forgiveness and thus have entrance into his kingdom for eternity as Christians we deal with life and death every single day in American society sometimes that's not something that we're really used to you folks out here probably get it better than most people because you deal with life and death just by the nature of what your professions are and as a community as a whole, you're tight-knit and you understand that. Your family stick together. You watch grandma and grandpa go through the last end stages. You see your young people make mistakes. You're a tight-knit community. And in the last few weeks, you've seen up front and close what can happen, just really what seems like in a blink of an eye. The reality is that as Christians, we deal with life and death. Only our life and death is, has eternal consequences. It's one thing to look at it from the perspective of, from agriculture where we just understand that things live and they die. It happens, right? It's another thing to begin to look at life and death from a spiritual perspective where you begin to understand that every human being is born with a soul and those souls are eternal. Now, where they spend eternity is on us and the words that we say, and the actions that we live out. Each and every one of us are set here for the purpose of providence, and that is to speak truth into someone's life. The one thing that will destroy the Christian message is unforgiveness. Which leads to the question of, well, do I have to forgive everything? Aren't there some things, Pastor, that I'm not responsible for forgiving? Aren't there some things that just are unforgivable? As a person, I would say absolutely. There are things that people do that you look at and you just say, that's just an unforgivable thing. I just cannot forgive you for that. But the problem is, is that Jesus sees it a different way. And so again, in Matthew chapter 18, you remember the, the uh, in chapter 18 where we're looking at that, and we go through and we're told of the parable of the unmerciful servant, right? And so in the parable of the unmerciful servant, before that starts, remember, Peter comes up to Jesus and he says to Jesus, and starting in verse 21, he says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, Peter's trying to be kind of a jackass here. Okay, Peter's gone from being the fisherman guy to trying to be like this smart kind of disciple who thinks that he understands what's going on. 
Okay, Jewish tradition said that you had to forgive up to seven times. After seven times, that was it. They were done. It was over with. They were dead to you. You didn't have to forgive them anymore. But the law said that you had to forgive someone seven times. Okay? And so, really, the law, what it was saying was keep a tally, hold people accountable. Hopefully, they'll figure it out by six. Okay? If they hit seven, that's their last chance. You forgive them one more time, and then after that, you don't have to forgive anything more. All right? And so, Peter's like, hey, so, so that's the law, right? Like, he's like all pharisaical, right? Like, all of a sudden, he's like this guru on the Torah. Right? And Jesus says to him, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And some translation says seven times 70. Okay, what Jesus is saying is, no, you're not going to take seven times 70. So that's uh, 490 times. So you just extend the tally, right? No, what he was like, it's an infinite amount of time. Like it doesn't stop. So what you're saying is that you just can continue to forgive and forgive and forgive. And so Jesus says this parable, right? And again, he goes to this parable, and so he's talking. And remember, this is the parable where the servant owes the king a whole bunch of money, right? And really, what he like would equate to today, in, by today's standards, would be like ten thousand bags of gold. Okay. It, it, it's, it's an insane amount. If you do like the math, like from a seminary perspective, it's like it's 10,000 talents is equal to 100 denarii. So it's a 6,000 to one concept, which means it would take you 20 years to earn 6,000 denarii, which was equal to the one talent. So essentially what this servant would have had to done was work for 200,000 years to pay back the king. Meaning it was a lifetime debt. It was unpayable. It could not happen. And he goes to the king and he says, I, I, can't, I can't do this. I can't pay you back. There's no way. And the king knows what his rights are. His rights are that he can throw this guy and his entire family in jail. He can go after everything. He can just start liquidating anyone who's connected to this guy. Take whatever he can get and then throw him in jail and be done with it. But instead the king says, I forgive you. He forgives his debt and sends him on his way. Now what does this guy do? He walks out, freshly forgiven, bumps into Bob, and Bob owes him a penny, right? And he's like, oh, I just remembered, Bob, you owe me a penny. And Bob's like, oh, I know, I, I haven't forgotten. I just, I, there's no, I can't pay it back right now. I, I just need a little bit more time. Like, if you could just, and what does this guy do? He's like, I know what my rights are. Takes Bob to court, holds him accountable, and throws Bob and his entire family in jail. Right? Who's Bob? He's in, the, he's in the Pastor Vern translation. Again, that's coming out in January, so be sure that you get it ordered. Who's Bob? Well, so, um, that's good. I'm going to make a note not to use Bob anymore. That was not a good idea. So the rest of the servants are talking at the water cooler, right? And, and they're like, hey, did you hear? Did you hear what happened to Bob? Did you hear what, what, what they did? And pretty soon it gets back to the king. And so the king summons this guy and he brings him in and he says, hey, I just heard this really crazy story. And I'm really hoping that you tell me that this is not true, that there's a mistake, right? And he looks at that and he says, well, I don't know what you've heard. He said, did, did you throw Bob in prison for a penny? And he's like, well, yeah, like he owed me. He goes, how much did, how much did you owe me? And the guy's like, oh, well, you know, all of a sudden he forgot, right? Uh, I'm not sure. It, uh, I, I don't know, some money. <laughs> yes, some money. And what does this guy do? Gets Bob and his family out of jail, takes this guy and throws him in jail, right? Rightfully so. That's just, that's what it's supposed to be. But the example, the parable, remember, is what Jesus is talking about. And so what Jesus is talking about is what we have committed, the crime that we have committed, what we owe would take us 200,000 years to pay off. It's unpayable. We can't do it. There's no way. Right? Romans tells us that the wages of sin are death. We know that clear back to Adam and Eve when they first made that fateful decision on that fateful day with that one tree, they went against God. And the response of God to that action was to curse mankind for eternity. Up until his return, every one of us is born in debt. 
You think being a college student is bad? Try being a human being on earth. You are immediately born into debt. You are born with a debt that you cannot pay. You are born with a death sentence on your head from the very beginning. The minute that you are born, it's true. You begin dying. And at that moment that you are born, you are sentenced to eternal damnation. It's a debt that none of us can pay. And that is the parable. That is, that is the emphasis. That is what Jesus is trying to say. What he is trying to explain is to lay a foundation for these apostles about what is about to happen. What he is saying is that when you come to God and ask for forgiveness, you are asking for something that you cannot earn. You can't get it on your own. You've got to go to the king. You've got to fall before him. You've got to beg for mercy. You've got to declare through confession, I cannot pay this debt. I know I can't, and I am asking you to forgive it. And the king says, yes. Now, if you've been forgiven something that would take you 200,000 years to pay off, which means that you know you would never, ever be able to pay off, if you are given that gift, then how should we respond to each other? For some pretty trivial stuff, right? I mean, I grew up hearing the story about my grandfather who rode to Texas f to go do some work and had left his prize hunting dog. He was from Kentucky. He left his prize hunting dog with his dad. And he was going to go, he had the opportunity to go do a work on a cattle ranch for a short period of time, do a job, and then he was going to come back. And he told everybody, he told his dad he was coming back. He just needed him to watch his dog. And this was his prize hunting dog. And he left it with his dad. He went to Texas. He came back about nine months later. And his dad had sold his dog. Now, I know you all here in Bonanza can understand the depth of what I'm talking about here. Like, this was his prize-winning coon dog. All right? It's a big deal. And his dad sold it. So I grew up hearing how my great-great-grandfather never spoke to his dad again. That was it. He'd sold his dog behind his back, and that, they were done. It was over with. I don't know that carrying something on earth over a dog is worth it. But these are the things. These are family things. I use my own example. But we all have the dog story, right? We all have something. We all know people in our family who don't talk to each other anymore. We all know the friends that we've had, friendships that have failed because somebody did something to us, right? We're certain that what they did was unjustified, it was wrong, and therefore we are justified in carrying this grudge against them because they earned it. They deserve it. See, but Jesus says that, we, that there's no offense that you don't get to forgive. All right? The story is that how we treat others in regards to forgiveness is directly to how God will treat us. You see, in life, there are some offenses that I know are difficult. All right? I know there are offenses that are far greater than selling your dog. I know there are offenses that family does against family that are unspeakable. We don't talk about it. Right? We shudder at the idea of a father beating his children in the middle of the night. We shudder even more at the idea of a father abusing his children sexually in the middle of the night. These are things that we look at and we say, that's just unforgivable. We look at these crimes of, 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 of these kidnappings or these random murders, these different things, and we say, there's no forgiveness for that. Right? The, the thing is, is that, that, that it, it starts out little tiny things. Those are these ones that we don't want to talk about. But as life progresses, offenses grow from, you know, taking the favorite toy at, at playtime in preschool to eventually, you know, somebody actually, we get betrayed. They, they cheat us. They've assaulted us. They, they've abused us. We deal with the pain that is a result of the brokenness that came from the garden to start with. All right? We live in a broken and sinful world where our choices lead to very tragic 
and damaging outcomes, and yet we are called to forgive. And that can sometimes be the most difficult thing of all. You see, we live by these little antidotes, things like, well, you fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Right? We walk around in this protective stance. Nobody's going to take advantage of me. We walk around and we say, we're not going to do it. And yet the Apostle Peter asked Jesus, how many times must I forgive? And Jesus says, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. You see, Christ is saying that if your brother or your sister comes to you and asks for forgiveness, you offer it to them. It takes work and it takes effort, but it's effort that's worth the work. And you see, forgiveness of debts gives us that release that we were talking about. It gives us the freedom. The act of forgiveness is not even necessarily for the other person. It's for the person who's been wronged. It's a freedom from the offense that has been made against you. You see, in Matthew 5, 9, Jesus says, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. We cannot have peace if we are carrying a grudge in our heart. You cannot have peace if you're holding on to poison that inspires and directs and demands vengeance. It's impossible. What's even more impossible is for us to walk around with unforgiveness in our hearts and then to turn to God and ask for forgiveness for our own sins. And those of us who truly live in the Spirit will recognize that and sooner than later you begin to find that your prayer life is withering on the vine because you are carrying unforgiveness inside of you. But what if the person isn't even sorry? Well, sometimes you just have to do that. You see, there was once this innocent man who came and, and he, was, he was found, he was accused of, of, of being guilty. He was, you know, he's in the process of uh, 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 causing this, this riots and so forth. And so people were like, hey, you're just this person that, that's just causing problems. You're disrupting society. You're not going along with what we said. You're, you're speaking out against the established norms. And so they brought him before the higher court and the higher court went over it. And, and they, they said, well, there's no reason for a conviction. Like, you guys are just upset with what he's saying. There's, there's no reason for it and so they went back and they said well you know here's the problem he's actually saying things that are somewhat politically charged and and they may kind of go against and so we're really afraid that if he keeps going down this road it's going to cause these riots and if there's these riots there'll be an overall revolt within society and it's just undoing the rule of law and so the innocent man despite being judged twice and found innocent by two separate courts was condemned to death And so while, he, you know, his conviction and, and, and at that time they were very quick with their, they're very uh, proficient in their processing. And so this man is convicted and he is convicted of a capital crime essentially that he was found innocent for. But they said, no, we're just going to do it. And so while he's hanging on this cross, dying a criminal's death, he raises his head to heaven and he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. You see, when we look at the example of Christ, we see a Jesus who took the sins of the entire world, the past, the present, and the future. And as he hung there, he supernaturally and intimately reached into each and every one of our individual lives, and he took every single one of our offenses, all of our offenses against God and against each other, and he put it on himself. And then he asked on your behalf for God to forgive you. 
And in John 19, verse 30, it says that when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. And on the cross, Christ declared that it is finished, which in Aramaic means that it is paid in full. And as such, Christ is declaring from the cross that the debt of man has been paid in full. So we might be struggling with forgiveness today. And if, if there's things that are within you so that you're looking at and you're thinking to and you're struggling with forgiveness and, and, and there's pain in your life, then I want you to be able to leave here this morning with some clearly defined steps on how to forgive those who've offended you. And so I'm going to give you the seven steps to Christian forgiveness real quick as we close. Number one is, is that we recognize first and foremost that we are sinners and in need of forgiveness ourselves. Number two is that we make a choice to forgive others. You got to make a conscious choice to do it. It's not easy. It doesn't happen naturally. Three, we believe and experience Christ's loving forgiveness in our lives. Four, we recognize that Christ helps us to overcome negative thoughts that are blocking our ability to forgive. That's where you have to go in prayer. You've got to go to God and you have to say, I'm struggling with this. And God is not going to condemn you for that. He's going to say, I know. I know it's not easy. And then walk you through that process. Five, the Holy Spirit empowers us with the right attitude to forgive those who have hurt us. Number six, we need to trust that God will judge all the wrongs in the world. So often within our society, we are looking for justice immediately. If someone wrongs us, we have to take action. We have to hold them accountable, and then we want to demand payment for it. But God has been very, very clear on this topic, and that is that vengeance is His. It is that all persons will be judged, that all persons will be held accountable, and that it is not on us to do it. And so we need to recognize that God will judge all the wrongs in the world. Number seven, when you are struggling with forgiving others, talk with someone that you respect and trust to give you wise counsel, such as a pastor or a close friend. Talking through the process can help you get to the point where you're able to go and have the discussion and offer the forgiveness that you need to give. Oftentimes when you begin to talk about the wrong, you begin to realize little pieces of it. You begin to realize that maybe it wasn't quite as wrong as you thought it was. Maybe it was misconstrued. Maybe you've made it worse over the years that you've replayed it over and over and over again. Our mind will naturally exaggerate things. Not only our mind, but Satan. Satan loves unforgiveness. He doesn't want it to come out. He wants you to be full of poison. Why? Because it destroys your prayer life. It destroys your relationship with Christ. It inhibits the Holy Spirit from being able to speak to you. It prevents you from being a good husband, a good wife. It prevents you from being a good parent, a good neighbor. Unforgiveness literally poisons you and imprisons you where you are at the moment nonstop. Jesus' fourth point is that God is always faithful for to give. And so as we close this evening, this morning, I just want to go ahead and close with this one point, And that again is that God is always faithful for to give. The Apostle John gives us this assurance in 1 John 1, 9, where he writes, But if we confess our sins to him, if we confess our sins to Jesus, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. You see, sometimes the hardest person in life to forgive is ourselves. And if you refuse to release the forgiveness that is needed for yourself, you are binding that just the same on earth as if it was someone else who had offended you. When Jesus said the debt is paid in full, he wasn't joking. It wasn't just a slogan for a t-shirt or a bumper sticker. He was saying the debt is paid in full. When he prayed that God would forgive you, what he was doing was praying God's forgiveness over you. That's why when God looks at you, God says, what sin? God can't look on sin. So if you have prayed and confessed your sins to Jesus and asked for forgiveness, his blood has supernaturally been poured over you. You are found clean. You are white as snow. And God looks at you and says, what sin? Jesus says, I will cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. 
They are buried on the ocean floor. They are no more. God does not see your sin. You're presented as holy and pure before the Father. But Jesus is very clear that if you bind it on earth, it will be bound in heaven. Sometimes the hardest person for us to forgive is ourselves. We put this pressure on ourselves to be something. We sit in our minds and in our prayer lives and we look at things. We remember the mistakes that we've made. We say, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. We say, I believe that I'm forgiven. We say that we believe, John, 1 John 1, 9. We say, well, I've confessed it, but then in the back of our mind, I'm pretty sure God can't forgive me for that. I'm pretty sure God hasn't forgiven me for that. And the reality is, is that oftentimes we live in churches that aren't very good at forgiveness either. Sometimes the worst enemy that Christians have are other Christians who are far too happy to remind us of our past and never let us move past it. And so we tell ourselves late at night when it's just us and God that, well, if they really knew who I was, they wouldn't even let me inside the church. God, I've been struggling with this thing over and over and over. And so I just, I either, either I'm just failing and I really don't love you because it says if I love you, I'd obey your commands. And I'm trying, but I just can't seem to kick this habit or I can't just seem to control my mouth or I can't just seem to get it together as a parent. And so I just, I must not be forgiven. Is it God who hasn't forgiven you or is it you? Because my Bible says that the minute that you confess it, it's forgiven. My Bible also says that there is a person who is a great deceiver who goes out of his way to destroy you, who lurks like a lion who wants to rip your throat out, who is the king of deception, who will use little tiny pieces of truth and twist them just enough so that you actually believe that you aren't forgiven. Who's more than happy to remind you that you were probably a little too harsh with your kid that day? Maybe you were unfair towards your spouse. Maybe you skipped church. Maybe you weren't completely up front with your neighbor when you made that business deal. And it sits there and Satan twists it and says, and you say that you're a Christian. And then we begin to think, maybe I'm not. Maybe it's unforgivable. But my Bible says that he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. You see, we have all sinned and we deserve God's judgment. God the Father sent His only Son to satisfy that judgment for those who believe in Him. Jesus, the Creator and the Eternal Son of God, who lived a sinless life, loved us so much that He died for our sins. He took the punishment that we deserved. He was buried and He rose again from the dead. If you truly believe and you trust this in your heart, receiving Jesus alone as your Savior and declaring that Jesus is Lord, then you will be saved from judgment and you will spend eternity in heaven. Because John 3, 16 states that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you're here today and you're struggling with something that's in your life, perhaps you realize for the first time the incredible act of love that Christ has committed on the cross. Maybe you're well aware of what it's been. But you're still dealing with a degree of unforgiveness. You're still hanging on to something in your past that you don't believe was quite covered by what he did on the cross. Maybe there's just a hardness and an unforgiveness in your heart towards another then I would ask that you let today be the end of all of that and that you let today be the first day of a life of freedom found in forgiveness. Let's bow our head. Father God, we just come before you so grateful for this community, grateful for this church and what it represents within this community.